Hey friends, welcome to the Gardener's Workshop live from the farm. It's your friend Lisa Mason Ziegler and thanks so much for um, jumping on here with me today. We're gonna have a little look around the grow room, kind of at what's sprouting, what am I doing here in the grow room. And then I'm also gonna share a little bit gang about <laughs> A little bit of cool flower suffering that's going on and we'll talk about that now before we jump in you know if we haven't met before you know welcome here um, I'm with the gardenersworkshop.com where we are an online learning center and have an online garden shop and we are just all about helping people to grow cut flowers whether it's a home gardener to starting a business to people that are already in business doing it and just helping folks to kind of come along and do that. We just have tons of resources over at thegardenersworkshop.com um, to help you do that. We have free resources and we have paid resources. And you may see some of our um, followers here commenting with the sunflower emoji, and that's how our students identify themselves to me and to other people, and I just love seeing them, y'all. So if you have taken any of our online courses, we would love for you to comment with the emoji, but the number one thing you can do to help me is to like and then share this broadcast after we're done. When you do that, it saves it on your feed um, so other people can see it, and it helps Facebook to show us to other people. People. So we just really, really appreciate that. And before I dive into seedlings and cool flowers, I have to show you guys the book that I am just devouring. So um, my good friend, Jessica Walliser, um, she is the author of Good Bug, Bad Bug, which if you're in my flower farm in school, that's one of the books that I recommend. Um, and I've spoken of it time to time. I mean, every person that owns a home, whether you're just a yard person or a home gardener or a farmer should have the Good Bug, Bad Bug book. It's a little handbook. Well, Jessica is quite the bug person. And so she has just, it's, I just got my copy yesterday, has just come out um, with, this is the revised and updated second edition. And the title of the book is Attracting Beneficial Bugs to Your Garden. Y'all, when I got this yesterday, you know, this is just a really, really busy time for us here at the Gardener's Workshop. I opened the book standing in my kitchen last night when I was cooking, and I burnt dinner just about. Um, because I just, every, the, the photography is amazing. I mean, you just really are going to learn the story about this is what we live to garden for, y'all. So, of course, it's available from bookstores anywhere, um, but check out Jessica's book, Attracting Beneficial Bugs to Your Garden. This is the secret sauce to my farm, y'all. We just really farm for these guys so that we can get them here to do their work, and I just highly recommend it. You know, I don't recommend a lot of books. There are so many great books out there, but I just have to tell you that I was pretty drawn to this one. Um, so... That would be a great book to read in February, right? So let's talk about cool flowers for a minute um, before I kind of show you what I have going behind me. So, you know, this is classic January and February for those of us that are listening, um, that are in the United States. This means that we're kind of in the even if you live in the deep south, this is the coolest time of the year. For the rest of us, we're in winter, right? Um, so, you know, this is the time we start questioning ourselves. We start looking a little too closely at our cool flowers for those things that have been planted outside in the fall. We question how they are. Are they alive? Did I do something wrong? Um, and then I also understand this. People are feeling the urge to plant more cool flowers even before that window of opportunity of six to eight weeks before your last frost. And I'm just here to say, you know, that's not gonna go away. Here I am 24 years in and I'm still, you know, wondering and waiting and suffering a little bit. And that's just the way that winter gardening goes. And if you don't have the gut to do that, then I would say stick to warm season tender annuals. This is kind of how it goes and even some years, I grow a crop amazingly well, and then I lose it the next year. And it's really usually about water situation, you know, rainfall or snow um, problems. And 
you know, so it happens to all of us. So I did a little walk about, and I actually made a video, which I don't think I posted it anywhere yet, at least. I did a walk about in my cool flower garden before this latest storm came. Um, we were forecasted to get snow about four or five inches, which we did get, which meant my covers came down. And then um, we had that snow going right into like almost single digits, but we did, 11 degrees was the lowest that we recorded here. Um, which are pretty cold. And it's like, you know, in the way that the cool flower concept is, why even though I only grow what is winter hardy in my zone, you still have conditions that can take them out. And so why expose them to such deep cold conditions if you don't have to? We put row covers up, right? Well, couldn't do that. They were all frozen under snow. So I did this walkabout before all that happened, knowing that we were gonna have snow and then deep cold. And then I did a walkabout afterwards. And I am just really happy to report that um, the things that I had questions about before the storm even came that already looked questionable, and most of those were operator error, um, that's the other thing. So often people are, you know, you know, chattering about how this didn't make it or that didn't make it online, but you don't know the rest of the story. Did you plant it on time? Were they pretty healthy seedlings? Or did you direct seed it and give it time to become an established little plant before it went into winter? Or did you plant it too soon and it got too big? There is so much more to the equation and I think that so many of us are just so quick to throw in the towel. And I know I can do that same thing. Um, so the ones that I lost, I'm not surprised by. Um, the number one that comes to mind, and I can't wait to show you the ones that we, Bobo started them on Monday, and they are beautiful this morning, um, calendula. Calendula, um, we always fall plant, and it's the earliest blooming flower in my garden when it's fall planted. That is not gonna be the case with very early spring plantings. Well, the plants that we planted they didn't get the attention they should, and they were just kind of puny when we planted them. That's just the reality. And guess what? They're goners. They're not, you can't even tell anything was planted there. Their holes are empty um, on the Bio 360. So, um, so we've restarted those. The other ones that look dead, but I'm never sure if they're really dead until spring is Billy Balls, Crespedia. And because that is another one that we're kind of right on the edge, I'm in zone 7B, 8A, and I don't even know that it would be winter hardy in 7A um, without a lot of intervention. And that's what I want everybody to really, I'm just kind of lamenting and just reminding people. The whole point of the cool flower concept is to grow the cool flowers in the conditions that they thrive in. That means without a lot of manipulating from us. You can surely manipulate. If you have hoop houses, you know, that take you can take them to the next level, but that's not what the concept is based on. Um, so, you know, um, Craspedia did excellent for us last year, but last year we didn't have a lot of rain and snow like we are this year, and we're having colder conditions, so I think it looks dead. Um, and so the other one that looks really injured, but I think it's like just kind of dragging its leg behind it, you know, <laughs> it's still there, but it's not very happy is the Amis. Um, I grew Amy, um, Ami Graceland and Ami Green Mist. Um, and Green Mist looks better than the Ami Graceland. I think Graceland is toasted and they actually looked pretty dadgum good going into winter. Um, but I'm just questioning now if they weren't too big. So we have um, restarted a couple of those, and then I'm doing a test. Um, you know, as we have um, kind of downsized our production operation, we're ramping up our learning operation, and part of that is succession planting and seeing how we can now make the most out of those cool flowers that we're good at growing. And Godaisha is one of those. It's kind of a flash crop for us. And so I fall planted it, and then um, we fall planted it twice on two different, like three or four weeks apart. The first planting got huge. Um, we planted it on time, but fall didn't stop. So the Godaisha was looking rather large. We planted a second planting in the fall, which we pinched. 
and then we've got some started that we're going to take a look at here. And um, so, you know, we aren't really ramped up to start this for very early spring, but part of what we really want to investigate over the next two years is pushing cool flowers. I'm in the mid-Atlantic, southeastern Virginia. We typically have pretty cold um, winters. I mean, when I say cold, it's that's right, relative to where you live, right? Cold to us is 11 degrees. Um, I know cold to my friends in the north, um, you know, 11 degrees is like a walk in the park. Um, but so I'm in the mid-Atlantic zone, 7B, 8A, we teeter back and forth. And um, so we kind of have the middle of the road conditions. And so what we're really going to find out is kind of a normal behavior here for us is that we go right from winter into the heat and humidity. I mean, a true spring, we have had true spring the last, probably in the last four years, two or maybe three of them have had true springs because you know what everybody around here says, oh my gosh, is it ever going to get warm? It's like, no, y'all, this is spring, you know, cool nights with pleasant days, but it's still too cool to really plant your warm season stuff. So we are going to try to figure out a little bit of more succession planting with cool flowers out in the field, 100%, um, and how is it worth it to try to succession plant X, Y, or Z. And so we're really excited about doing that. And um, so you you don't won't see this as many of the standard flowers that we've grown for the last 23 years, but you're going to still see a lot of flowers coming out of this garden. So I'm standing here in my grow room and I am really pleased to show you guys. So what are we starting now? So normally without our, you know, under normal production times, we would be starting right now, which we have a lot of our straw flowers because we don't fall plant them. They just too iffy over winter and we start stock. Um, typically, I don't have any started here, but we would also be starting um, the Sweet William variety, the Amazon series, only the Amazon series because it'll go from seed to bloom in 16 weeks. Um, and a lot, several other cool flowers would we very early spring plant, you know, Feverfew, Limbata. Um, we don't do any direct seeding. Um, I'll start some more dill. We're doing Bupleurum in the trays. Um, if you don't know how we start Bupleurum, what happens is we direct seed Bupleurum in the fall because our grow room is just too hot. You know, I mean, we're, it's just too warm in here. However, during winter, like now, the conditions in here down on the floor are much cooler. If you aren't already a member of my special closed Facebook group called The Flower Farmer Show, request to get in there and pin to the top is how I start Bupleurum in the winter in cell trays, not in soil blocks. In um, 128 plug trays and all the steps are right there. So Bupleurum is one. Um, and so we are usually starting a lot more than this, but this year we got some test seeding going and I'm going to show you here. So we have um, restarted. Let me turn this around. And y'all don't want to look at my mug. Um, we've restarted a couple of the things that I've mentioned. But look, oh, first we have to look down here. Look down here. This is the calendula that Bobo started on Monday. And so it was pushed up underneath. See, that's where the light, how they get light there. I pulled them out so we could see them. So this is the new variety um, that we've added to our store, Ivory Princess. That's the creamy, gorgeous ivory colored one. So that was started January 27th. I don't even know what today is, but I believe that was Monday. So some of them are still just emerging. You can see they're still coming along here. Um, and this is, oh my gosh, y'all, look at that name, cantaloupe. Who does not want to grow a calendula named cantaloupe? Um, it's just, it's orange, obviously, but I think it's that pale, beautiful color. So because we lost all of our fall planted, which I previously described was totally operator era, um, then we have restarted. So these will get planted um, in the next, well, probably about two or three weeks, probably. So they live under there because they're getting light. And you can see I have sticky traps. You know, our fungus net protection, prevention, 
control is in full swing here. You can see um, we have sticky traps on every level. Um, you can never have enough sticky traps. Sticky traps um, trap the adults, and we can look at this one. This one's pretty, um, I just opened this one up yesterday, I think. You can see there's a couple of things on there. Some of it's dirt too, soil. Um, but it's a real monitoring tool. You can kind of see what is going on in your grow room. Fungus gnats are a reality of seed starting indoors in greenhouses, wherever you are. Um, so you have to practice prevention out of the gate. So we always have sticky traps installed to catch adults. And then every um, Wednesday, this is what I add, Nat Troll. You can find that on our website. This is the one ounce package. You can buy this, a two pack of this, or actually a four ounce. Um, and I just put this, I include this in my watering can every Wednesday. That, when I, and I just water as normal, um, because the fungus gnats lay their eggs in the soil. And so that is a larvicide, and it kills any larva that's in the soil. And let me just tell you, two years ago, I didn't have any um, natural, and I just kept procrastinating. You know how it is, you get busy, right? Well, we had an outbreak of fungus gnats in this building. Oh my gosh. I mean, once you get them, you will never get rid of them if you really let them get out of control. Um, and so by practicing prevention, because they come from everywhere. They come in the door, they come everywhere. Um, so by nipping them in the bud and not allowing them to reproduce, it makes all the difference. So enough about that. And you can find that at thegardenersworkshop.com. So this, um, these are those gorgeous peach straw flowers. I think we're actually sold out of the seed now. I'm not quite sure. I didn't look, I should have. These were started, when were these started? January 15th. So I knew, so what is that, two weeks ago? Um, I'm kind of keeping the air temperature a little cooler in this room right now because I don't want my plants to grow too fast. We're just crazy weather outside and I'm not ready to plant yet. So I'm trying to just hold my plants back. That means cooler air temperatures, less fertilizer. So they're still growing and happy. They just aren't growing at a fast rate of speed, right? So this is, um, which straw flower is this? Sorry, y'all, I have to look. This is the white. And I have all the colors here. I think that's light yellow, the mix. There's several different ones here. And look at this. Sometimes I just lay sticky traps flat on the surface because they'll land there too. I will say that a big part of trapping adult fungus gnats is they just happen to either fly into it like you would see over there or they just land on it. So this is some stock that was started at the same time as that straw flowers we just looked at in the tray. I did this on a demo. And so this is a single stem. Um, you know, stock flowers are one and done. And these guys are ahead of everybody else. Um, and so we will, um, all of these guys will get planted outdoors when they're approximately three to four to five inches tall. It just really depends. And they will sit outside on the carport for a couple of days to get acclimated. Um, and that's been a question I've been getting a lot of is, do you have to harden off cool flowers? Well, in general, um, you... Whenever you're growing indoors like we are right here, you always want to acclimate your plants to the outdoors, right? Whether it's warm season or cool season. However, if you are planting cool flowers um, into hoops and row cover outside, that's kind of a really protected um area so you're kind of buffering them so you don't really have to harden them off quite as much and i think a lot of people have gotten confused about that it's not that you don't harden them off it's that they just get hardened off under hoops and row covers um, you can't do that with warm season but you can definitely do it with cool season um, i'm pulling out these ones that um, i just want to tell you a little bit more about um, what is this so the rest of those are stock 
Um, so you definitely have to acclimate. I mean, wind is a big problem. If I were to take these and just set them out on the carport right now, out in the open, you know, for the first time and leave them indefinitely, if the wind as it's blowing now, they'll just blow them over. You have to kind of harden, you have to give them a little bit of protection. Um, so hardening off is definitely a benefit. I just do a lot of that with cool flowers out in the garden under hoops and row covers once they're actually planted. So this is what I wanted to show you. So this is, um, imagine that, a golden retriever hair. Um, this is Billy Balls, Craspedia, which I've just taken this off the heat. You can see that there were still in the birthing mode here. Um, and so we are going to plant these guys again um, because, you know, my fall planted stuff looks pretty um, dead out there. But I also wanted to really um, kind of take a look at what is the stem length difference. Is it worth succession planting by fall and very early spring? I will tell you that our billy balls fall planted, we'll get 40 inch stems. We're gonna see what these give us and see if it's viable. This is an experiment I'm doing. This is something, I did this, um, I think I did this Saturday on YouTube. Um, this is stock and I put two to three seeds in each individual block. You know, stock is a one and done crop and we're always looking for ways to minimize labor. And so we plant eight rows of stock in a 30 inch wide bed. And so instead of having to plant eight plants across that bed, if a block had more than one plant, you would only have to plant maybe half of eight. You would only plant four times across the bed, but you're getting the same plant. So this is a real experiment. We'll see how it goes. Um, I know that when sometimes the plugs come from plug suppliers, the stock in a plug tray has more than one plant. So that's what kind of fed me to do that. This is Godisha, which is still, you know, you can see it's still just being born. I literally moved this off of heat this morning. Um, and where this is gonna be the very early spring planting um, that's going out into the field, hopefully um, in about two or three weeks. And the rest of these are just different stocks. So we've added several, we're in the process, they're not on the store yet. We're adding, um, you know, we added all the straw flowers now in solid colors. I mean, I think straw flowers are such an underused flower in the commercial world for commercial customers and particularly for bouquets as fillers. They are long lasting, bright colors. You just can never have enough of them. So we now have all the straight colors um, and I'm growing them all this year so we can just really um, compare them and see what is up with them. Um, and so the straw, the, the stock is another one that we don't fall plant. We only very early spring plant it and it's just a great crop for us. And I did see a question come across here about that. So I am gonna actually put you back up here. There's, that's the timer I had installed on my room, y'all. Uh, my entire room here. And I didn't get that until about maybe three or four years ago. I met an electrician at a show and he said we were he heard me talking about why a timer is so important to have on your grow lights because um you know my our lights we wanted to come on at 6 a.m and go off at 10 p.m and you think you'll remember but you never do and i was talking about the craziness of all the timers i had plugged in at this room i mean i had enough plugs i mean this room was wired for that but he came over and said, I have a little secret to tell you. I'm an electrician and there is a, a device you can purchase and have your electrician install that turns all the plugs on and off. It was like epiphany. So that's what I got for Christmas that year. I mean, it cost like two grand, I think, to get it installed here, but um, it was, it's just saved my life. Um, so I am going to look back here now and see if we have any questions. And I will do my best to answer some of those. And so you guys, if you haven't already, um, sign up for my farm e-news because we 
basically most often only send out one a week on Wednesdays at four o'clock and it's like a headliner. It's like the front page of the newspaper. It headlines, you know, how to do something, special stuff going on, things to do now. I mean, just has a lot of great content, product highlights, any specials going on. Like, and there's a resource, you know, claim whatever webinar that's coming up, get your seat, all that kind of stuff. Um, we have one coming out tomorrow um, that's kind of like breaking news for Valentine's, um, some special stuff on it. And you can just do it on the homepage of thegardenersworkshop.com. So I just really um, encourage, every, that's kind of like the lifeline of our farm. It takes like six people feeding information into that newsletter. Different people have different portions of it to kind of make sure we keep all of our bases covered. And um, so you just really need to check that out. And when things come back in stock, that is also how you'll learn about that. I know that tomorrow, the announcement that's going out is that we have been waiting since, I think last August, we just got the hand hose, the right handed hand hose. Let me tell you, those little hand hose, Every girl on our farm all these years has carried one around like as a purse. It has so many uses and we just finally got them. And guess what else is back in stock? The shears, the cut flower shears. Oh my gosh, the ones that we've used for years and we just adore them. Super small and lightweight and um, there are both great um, Valentine's gifts. You can buy a Valentine's gift for yourself, by the way, y'all. I do that kind of stuff all the time. Although I have a great gift giver, my husband is the best. Like he gave me that timer for this room, right? But sometimes I just have to buy stuff myself. So go for it. You are so welcome, Johanna. I see we have just folks and lots of students on here. It always makes my heart swell. I will tell you that um, keep your eyes peeled for, um, if you aren't already, um, subscribe to my podcast, Field and Garden. I have some really great interviews coming up. Um, I talked to Val Shermer about growing lilies. I am actually interviewing Dave Dowling this afternoon on Snapdragons and then one on Lizzie Amphis. Just kind of the down and dirty information, y'all. And so you should definitely subscribe to my podcast was where all that's coming out. And I just interviewed earlier this week Jonathan Lease of Spring Forth on growing sunflowers. And, you know, Jonathan, if y'all don't know about Jonathan, Jonathan and Megan um, are in North Carolina, and they're the instructors of our no-till micro-scale flower farming course, and they have the most amazing business model. They only harvest and sell in very early spring to early summer because they want the summer to put up food, to be with their kids, um, and to have a life. And it's a very interesting model that I think most of us only dream of, and they have actually put it into action anyway. Because he targets spring, um, he went through a phase of where he only grew white flowers because that's what's in demand most often. So we're talking about that and the other flowers and what flowers he was growing. And so that's coming out in the coming weeks too. So please subscribe, review it if you like what you're hearing. That just makes the podcast people show my podcast to more people. And hello people. All frozen in ice here in Texas, 8A, electric is out. Oh, your plants will be fine, Paige. Um, ice and snow actually protect your plants. So um, I hope you get power back on soon, but your cool flowers should be the least of your worries, right? All right, folks, I see lots of people. Oh, thank you, Brianna. Um, so what I was gonna say is, um, you know, Dave's course, registration is in June, then mine is in October along with Jenny Loves, and then we have two others in November. Um, and it's just gonna be here before we know it, y'all. What tips would you recommend for eucalyptus germination? Well, and so if y'all, you know, I mean, we did just, I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure there's any left. We, yesterday at 11.15, the mail came and um, eucalyptus seeds were unexpectedly in the mail. Um, tens of thousands of them, and I mentioned it, and we, I think, sold all of them out since yesterday. Um, so there's a lot of people starting eucalyptus, and I'll be really honest with you, um, Kaylee, I'd have to look it up. I don't, it's been so, I haven't started eucalyptus for two years because we haven't had any seed. Um, 
So I'd have to search. Um, I would put into a search engine, germinate, sowing or germinating eucalyptus and see the big question is, do you cover the seed or not? And what are its preferred conditions? But I can tell you this, it is incredibly slow. Um, that's why when I, put, I posted a reel this morning on Instagram about the seeds, and you can see in my hand is a eucalyptus transplant in a two inch soil block. I start them in the small block, and then we bump them up to the two inch block, and that one I'm holding in my hand is 12 weeks old. They, I don't grow anything else that takes that long. So that it's incredibly slow, so don't, so ensure that you are starting properly whether it gets covered with soil or not, and the temperature is right, and then just be prepared. Do your best to not over or under water. That's the problem with slow stuff. There's a lot of ways to kill them. Um, so that would be my tip. All right, so we have lots of friends here, a lot of people in really cold conditions. Oh boy, lots of snow and ice flying. Um, and I see that our team member, Jesse is on here. Jesse Graven um, is one of us, and she is always on my lives to kind of help facilitate. Yeah, Ami. Um, oh, Sheila, I'm glad you said that. Sheila says, I think I lost my status. Zone 7A, they still have a little green on them. I'm hoping they will pull through. That's exactly how mine look too, Sheila, and I do think they will. Um, I have an entire 50-foot bed of status because I planted all the different colors, and I, but I will say they got snapped a month ago, and they just don't look good. I was out there yesterday staring at them. It's like, do I start them again? Because we really need imagery of them. Do I start them again? And I just decided that there were enough that looked like they might have survived, so they may surprise us, and I really hope they are because fall planting of status gives you stem length like nothing else. So uh, my finger is crossed for all of us that planted status in the fall. Years past, status has come through like a gem. But we have had, um, we have really had, um, you know, some, some deep dips in temperatures with skyrocketing back up to heat. It's that craziness that I think really messes with the foliage damage. And that is one of the things that row covers can help buffer is by those crazy changes. Um, so yeah, and Jesse is anybody that wants to become a member of my private group. It is the Flower Farmer Show. And um, it's a private, you just have to request, answer the questions right, y'all. Um, and we'll let you in there. And um, there's some real good flower farming talk. Yes, status is a cool season hardy annual. I only learned that about three or four years ago. Um, all right, so, and I see Jesse has also put some links on here. Did you start straw flowers on heat mat until they germinated? Yes, Barb. So all of these trays you see behind me, um, stock, status, not status, straw flowers, Billy Balls, Godisha, what else did we have over there, stock? Um, we're all on my seedling heat mat setup um, until 50% of them show signs of life, and then I move them over here. So Margaret says, I'm loving my green trays. I can fit 900 seedlings on one shelf. Yeah, she's talking about, and this is another thing that is back in stock, but I'm telling you all, we buy all that they get. Those are imported from England, just like our soil blockers are. Um, different company, um, but these trays um, are super firm. They're hard. These will be lifer trays, and um, we have thousands more on order, but we don't know when they're coming, so they like eucalyptus. When that shipment is gone, we put them back out of stock, and then you can sign up to be notified when it comes back in stock, and that's for both the eucalyptus. We either have or don't have eucalyptus um, silver drop. No, dollar, no, not silver drop, I'm sorry. Um, it's the larger one. And if there's still some there, obviously grab them. But if they're sold out, as well as the silver drop, which we haven't had the silver drop yet, um, you can sign up to be notified because the way that works is when we do get the stock in, those people get emailed before we make it public. 
that it's on the store. And oftentimes we sell out of that stuff from that list before it ever goes public. That's the bottom line. So you need to sign up for both of the eucalyptuses and if the trays are sold out, but I don't think they are yet, um, and if you go there and they are sold out, then sign up. That's the key, y'all. I mean, that is a big part of real it with retailers and marketing is that because our supply chain is of such a mess that we have to do something to help people understand. So we've gone to the expense of adding that feature to our website now. When something goes out of stock, it automatically says get notified automatically when it comes back in. And that's what that's all about. So we love them. So Creek Haven Farm is asking, do I succession plant stock? So the problem that we have with stock here for me in the Mid-Atlantic is we get so hot so fast. Stock does not like to be warm. Um, so yes, to, to answer your question plainly, generally, yes, stock. I would plant stock every week as when we were in high production, as early as I thought I could get it out there. Um, we have planted stock into beds that we had to sweep snow off of um, because, you know, we prepare their beds in the fall with the biodegradable film on them. Um, we have, we've swept the snow off. Stock takes frost and freezing like a champ. Um, but what happens is if I plant them in the fall here with me, they typically try to bloom in the middle of winter. Um, so I, I can plant them as early as possible in very early spring, which, you know, we've even pushed it and done at the end of January. And then from January until like the 1st of March, once a week. But what you may find is those later plantings get shorter and shorter. And then you will just say, I'm not even bothering with those later ones. Um, but you have to really test that out for yourself. Um, where you are, it's all about the heat and humidity coming. And you also have to have some daylight. You can't put them but so early out there. So stock... Anything that's one and done stock, um, you know, obviously sunflowers, right? But also um, when we grow single stem coxcomb, those high dollar hybrids, you can do the same thing. We used to plant spring green every week. Um, not a bunch, but we would have it every week because we had one commercial customer that would buy it all every single week. Um, any tips on growing mountain mint from seed? Would it be a cool flower? No. Mountain mint, you know, and I'm, I don't have a deep depth enough experience to talk about this, but I will tell you that the mountain mint that I grow does not come from a seed. It comes from either a cutting or a root division. Um, I've seen the mountain mint that people grow from seed and it's not the same variety. Um, so typically, most of us, me included, you can find it because mountain mint, um, I think they call it the wide leaf mountain mint or the wide tooth maybe. I just saw this. It's actually in Jessica's book. Um, you can typically find that at like a master gardener plant sale because it is a huge pollinator plant. I mean, it's like the number one thing you could grow for pollinators is mountain mint. Um, and so you can buy one or two and split them and plant them, and let me tell you, just in three years, you plant them where you can control them because they're like any other mint, they're very invasive. The mountain mint that I see people growing from seed is nothing like, it's not the same, and I haven't grown it, so I can't tell you. Mountain mint from a root cutting, and I do not know the name of it. Um, I'm not gonna look it up, you can look it up. Um, and it is priceless in bouquet work, Floor, I mean, everybody loves it, all areas of different markets. So um, it's not a cool flower, it's a perennial. So when seeding seeds that call for light to germinate, do you put them under the light as well as the heat mat? That's a great question, Patty. When germinating, no. When a, light, when a seed says... Um, either do not cover or it needs light to sprout. That just means general room light. And I will tell you that what I have learned is that most of them don't really necessarily need light. They need oxygen. They don't need to be covered up because 
we, this made me question a germination chamber. A germination chamber is dark inside, but all that celosia does 100% wonderful um, in a germination chamber, which we use only for warm season tender annuals, not for cool flowers. And um, so sewing on the surface just means that air and um, just room light. You'd, because why you don't want to put them under a heat mat and under a grow light at the same time is you're, you're liable to cook them too much heat from top and bottom. Do you have a list of all of what you succession plant and how many times other than sunflowers? Um, yes, in my course, Flower Farming School, there's planting guides in there that have stuff of succession planting um, formulas on, um, not formulas, but Excel spreadsheets. Any vegetable seeds to start now? Which ones are the same cool season hardy category as stock? Um, so Jennifer, um, I think I've shared this in the past. There are a bunch of cool season vegetables. I would direct you to connect with my friend, um, Nikki Jabor, N-I-K-I -I Jabor, J-A-B-B-O-U-R. She's written like nine vegetable books. A couple of them are specifically, she lives in Nova Scotia, so she's colder than I am by a long shot. Um, she has year-round vegetable gardening. She has several great resources that will tell you about all of that in, vet, in the vegetable world. Um, but yes, there are lots of vegetables that can also um, grow like cool flowers. Question, what conditions will determine ready to put out early spring transplants? So if you're talking about your very early spring cool flowers is what I'm assuming, and the conditions don't really matter to me. It's more about the timeline. It is six to eight weeks before your last spring frost because that window of time allows your planting to get become established and get ready before the spring starts when it has to start growing on the top and performing. That's the whole point. So, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, we have planted stock into beds that we had to wait until the afternoon when the sun was bright and kind of loosens the snow up a little bit and swept or blew with a leaf blower um, the snow off the beds. Um, so it's not really, I mean, obviously you don't want to plant in the rain, but it's more about timing is of the utmost importance with the very early spring planting because the whole point is that you want the plants that you're planting in very early spring to have every minute of establishment time before they have to start growing. That's why fall planting beats the britches off of very early spring. They have all winter to get all snuggled down and comfortable before they have to like put the show on, right? All right, can you repeat where to go to learn how to grow Bupleurum? Um, so Jesse, I think, put the link in here. Then you need to join my closed Facebook group and it is The Flower Farmer Show. Search that. Request you have to answer three questions and then we will um, we approve them every day or so um, And then you'll be in and the bupleurum instructions are pinned right to the top For seeds that need to be direct sown, but aren't hardy to our zone for fall planting When do you direct seed versus first frost free day? Um, so Georgia that is the, the, the catch um, I we don't direct seed here where I am because our spring comes too fast. I mean, our summer comes too fast. So if you are up north, I have heard people of sowing their seeds, um, you know, out in the snow even. Um, the problem is, is that you have to wait for some warm conditions. Um, you can definitely pre-sprout your seeds indoors if you want to try to do that. But what I hear most northern growers doing is that they sow the seeds on the six to eight week window, but they don't always germinate until much later. Um, so I really don't have a better answer for you than that. Um, but pre-sprouting inside, that's one of the things that we do do with soil blocks, small blocks, you know, for those things that need the cool, but it's just too cold outside to get them sprouted. Sprout them and then you can plant the soil blocks just like you would if it was a transplant and it works really well. All right, y'all, I'm gonna look and see if there's any one last question. 
Any insight on your eucalyptus seeds? Do they require extra water as compared to other plants and flowers? I've heard they take lots of water. Um, and Mary, first off, you need to always take that kind of information with a grain of salt because everything is relevant to where you're located, to what your soil is like. Are they mulched? Are they not mulched? Um, so eucalyptus in my experience has been a really easy to grow transplant. Um, and I mean, we they get irrigated on a regular basis. I would not say that they are overly thirsty plants in my experience. But again, it is, if you live in the high desert, maybe they do take a lot of extra water. You know what I mean? That's why it's just so easy. I am so um, reluctant to answer certain questions anymore because people only take part of it, you know? And it's really hard and I don't wanna misguide anybody, but almost all the questions there are so many variables that affect the way that each one of us do things. The way I do it could be 100% different than you, even if you think you're doing it like I do, even because you're doing it just at the same time, but there's a lot of other stuff, right? So I would give them a whirl um, and just go for it. Seven below, oh my goodness. Oh, cool flower seedlings are growing away. Oh, the eucalyptus is still, for the silver dollar, is still in stock, Jesse said. But we are, I know, getting down to the last drop. Hi, Lisa. Potting up my eucalyptus plants about three weeks ago to the two-inch block. I think I've seen pictures. And now the leaves are turning brown Ooh, and crunchy. Any thoughts? I do water every day, and they dry out between but when I water, it seems like the water only reaches halfway up the block, no matter how much I water. Could this be an issue or something else? Hmm. So Kelsey, you know, I'm assuming you're using a blocking mix, right? Um, that would be a great question to post. I don't know if you're a member of the ASCFG um, about, I mean, that would be a search engine phrase. I'm just thinking if you posted, you know, eucalyptus leaves turning brown and crunchy with regular watering and see what comes up and that could lead you. There are so many universities that do all kinds of studies and research papers and that's how you kind of start hitting on that. Um, so, you know, if you feel like they're not perhaps the top half of the blocks not getting moistened, with a gentle pouring watering can. I have, let me show you. I have this little, I used to, this is what I used to use back in the day before I had a, before I was a commercial grower. But what happens is because this is all so little, it's a really gentle pour. I would perhaps, when they were totally dry, I would water the gently the top of all those blocks, water them from the top once, trying not to wash the soil away just to be sure the entire block is getting wet. And I know you don't want to sacrifice one, but I think I'd be really tempted after you're watering like you're watering currently, before you, before you do what I just maybe suggested, is to crack a block in half and see what's going on in there. You know, try not to sacrifice your plant. You can make another two inch block and drop it in maybe, um, but that would be the questions going on in my mind. All right, friends. Um, so I'm gonna answer this last question. Mary says, could I start straw flowers like you would microgreens? I have no idea how you start microgreens. So I'm sorry, Mary, I will take another question since I don't know that one. Kelsey, I've placed so many orders with you guys. I know you're sick of seeing my name come through. Love your shop. Oh, Kelsey, thank you so much. You know, I was just talking to another small business owner this morning I had an appointment with, and I was just telling him, we have the best team ever. You know, there is about, there's 14 of us. We're not all in the same building together, half of us probably. And I just have, everybody has the common love of gardening, farming, serving, teaching. You know, it's like everybody wants to help everybody. Never once has somebody said, oh my gosh, I don't want to answer this question again. It's not like that. It's like, oh, we have to, 
you know, maybe I'm going to add this to it. I mean, it's just, it is, I just can't even tell you what a wonderful um, experience it is for me um, to be a part of this amazing, growing group of people. Um, and we're just really, really excited. And I won't tell, I will tell you that sometimes it's really hard. You know, we, you know, when you start growing and getting bigger, you can't make everybody happy. And if I want to just, yeah, so sometimes it's really hard. It's a real lesson for some of the lessons that I teach in flower farming school about taking that this is business, it's not personal. You know, I, I, we have a whole session about that. It's like that's what people have trouble with disgruntled customers or having to collect money. It's because we make it all personal. And I have to remind myself sometimes because I will tell you, whenever we get a question about something or maybe a, a you know, whatever, it's an insult, <laughs> you know, but then I have to remember that that's how we get better. You have to learn how to take the boulders with the sweet replies like Kelsey has here. And so we appreciate hearing that, Kelsey, so very much. So from the whole Gardener's Workshop team, we love serving you guys. Remember to sign up for the farm news. If you want to stay in the know, we'd love to have you join us. Um, and until we meet again, um, see you over at thegardenersworkshop.com. Ciao.